Desolation in Haiti after Hurricane Matthew. Roofs have been ripped off homes. Possessions have been destroyed. People are now homeless. In the southwest alone, 30,000 homes have been ruined. The city of Jeremy saw 80% of its housing destroyed. People are clearing out what's left from their shattered homes. We've lost all of our valuables. All that we had is lost. We've seen all the destruction and we need help. Haitian towns and cities look more like scrap heaps than communities. A serious humanitarian crisis has unfolded. Graves are being dug for hundreds of victims, while in this hospital, the injured continue to arrive by the dozens. Since the passing of Hurricane Matthew, the relief effort is still being hampered by the floodwaters that have cut off communities in the southwest of the country. In Le Cai, this building is being used as a temporary shelter for those who have lost everything in the storm. But there's still a severe shortage of basic aid. I'm sick, but my son has been injured for three days and I don't have any medication. The UN estimates that up to 350,000 people are in need of food, clean water and medical supplies in a country still recovering from the devastating 2010 earthquake. Government officials were to address the crowd at this religious festival in the Oromia region, and, and the crowd just didn't agree and tried to prevent these officials to, to speak, and some protesters try even to take over the stage. And at this point, the police uh, replied with tear gas and uh, pro possibly a live fire as well. There was a movement of panic, a stampede ensued, and several dozen people are feared dead. Uh, a, a witness, an eyewitness on the ground said that he saw at least uh, 20 bodies on the ground. And for, for the moment, it's very difficult to know exactly how many people uh, died in this stampede. Uh, it's difficult to know as well if the police fired a live fire into the crowd. Uh, but what we know is that uh, the, 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 the number of deaths, uh, the death toll might, uh, might increase uh, when the details of what exactly happened uh, will arise in the next few days. When the bomb landed, there were flames and dark smoke. It caused vomiting and dizziness. The baby isn't recovering. He has blisters and wounds. They said he'd get better, but it's not working. This is just one line in a report from Amnesty International after analysing more than 30 attacks this year in Sudan's Darfur region. Experts are in little doubt the government has been using chemical weapons on rebels in the area's Jebel Mara mountains. Many of the victims refer to their skin first turning white and then actually falling off uh, with a f within a few days uh, after these attacks. So that's, that's very common and also leads us to believe uh, that uh, this was probably caused by some sort of a chemical agent. The symptoms varied between these attacks and this would tell me that there are likely to be more than one chemical in use as well as the possibility that the chemicals were mixed or different chemicals were used at different times for different attacks. Darfur has been embroiled in conflict since 2003, when minority groups began fighting against the Arab-dominated government. President Omar al-Bashir launched a ruthless counterinsurgency against the rebels, leading to some 300,000 deaths to date and leaving some 2.5 million displaced, with 4.4 million in need of aid. A joint UN-African Union mission has been in place since 2007, though security is still fragile and Bashir is already wanted by the International Criminal Court on charges of war crimes and genocide. For its part, the Sudanese government has denied not just the use of chemical weapons, but intense military operations too, pointing to ongoing peace talks. Given Sudan signed the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1999, however, any proof they've been used would only add to further potential charges of war crimes. It's time now for our in-depth report and analysis, and this Friday's focus is on Iraq. Supported by Peshmerga and coalition forces, Iraqi troops have almost completely encircled Mosul, the Islamic State group's de facto capital on that side of the border. The army and its allies are preparing to launch the second phase of an operation aimed at retaking the Ninawa Plain and liberating what is the country's second largest city. 
Mosul has been under control of the jihadist group since 2014, when it first entered Iraq, taking advantage of the religious and ethnic tensions already simmering in the country. Today, Iraq is trying to overcome these divisions in an effort to reject terrorist ideology. Our reporters Oriane Verdier and Stéphane Kenech give us an overview of some of the main forces involved in this pivotal battle. We are 15 kilometers from Mosul, behind the Kurdish front line. The men in fatigues are soldiers in the Iraqi army. In an uncommon joint effort, they will be working alongside forces of the Kurdish Peshmerga. The objective in the end is to liberate Mosul and put an end to ISIS's two-year presence in Iraq. The collaboration between the Peshmerga, Iraqi army and counter-terrorism forces is highly beneficial. We share a common enemy. Our objective is to liberate the Nineveh plain up until the Syrian border. We will have to clear the entire area. We will not go home until everything is cleared. Today, the de facto ISIS capital in Iraq is encircled by Peshmerga, Iraqi army and various armed militias. While ISIS has brought them together as a shared enemy, there are still many different disagreements between the groups. Over the last two years, the Peshmerga have taken advantage of the situation to claim land in disputed territories from Baghdad. They are now ready to enter Mosul with the Iraqi army, but under specific conditions. A first condition for our participation in such a battle is for the Peshmerga to be equipped with weapons and all the things they need, because the liberation of Mosul will be done neighborhood by neighborhood, house by house. Another condition is to have formulated a plan for how to deal with Mosul City. There are a lot of minorities in this town. Kurds, Sunni, Shia and Christian, Yazidis, Turkmen, Shabak and Kakai. All of these communities live together in Mosul. We need to consider each of them and the part they will play in Mosul's future. If one group is marginalized, one way or another a new Daesh will appear. That is why it's important to know how to deal with Mosul. The Peshmerga are saying they are willing to give back power to regional communities. That's why they are backing Sunni tribal militias who originate from the Nineveh plain. The Sunni militias are mostly united under the name Hasha al-Watani, and they are counting on taking part of the highly anticipated offense. As you can see, here is the wider province where Mosul is located. And that bright red light over here represents Mosul City. Our army, Hajd al-Watani, is probably the most important part of this coalition. Because in our ranks we have people who originate from both the city of Mosul itself and the surrounding Nineveh province. We are currently in contact with a lot of people inside Mosul. And they're ready to help us to liberate the city from the inside. The Hasha al-Watani Sunni militias are not backed by Baghdad central government. But they say they have 2,500 soldiers who are ready to fight. They are united under the command of the former governor of Nineveh province, Atal al-Najafi. They are counting on the financial and logistical support of Arab countries and in particular Turkey. There is some influence of the Arabic countries or Turkey that will equal the Iranian influence also. We know that the Iranian influence in Iraq is a high influence. And if there is no other influence which equal that, it's one side influence inside Iraq. So we need a balance here in Iraq that the Arabic, uh, the, uh, the Sunni in Iraq feel that they are not weak, they are strong, and get their proud in themselves, then they can get the confidence with the others. Atta al-Najafi and the Kurdish government want to create a semi-autonomous region in the Nineveh plain, but Baghdad's central government is against this project. The plans for the Battle of Mosul are almost done, but the different regional actors are all looking to take a piece of the territory, leaving the fate of Mosul very uncertain. 
Well, for more on this, let me introduce our guest. Jos Tilterman is Programme Director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. Hello, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, having a common enemy offers Iraq a rare opportunity to resolve some of the divisions that pre-existed the Islamic State group's invasion. Are there signs that the Iraqi authorities are making the necessary preparations for this temporary unity to stick after this common mission is accomplished? You, you know, you make a very good point. With the common enemy, really, there should be a unified front. But the fact of the matter is, is that after 2003, Iraq has incre increasingly fragmented. And so even if there is a desire uh, to unify forces in order to oust the Islamic State from Mosul, uh, the fact is that the government is so dysfunctional and so divided and so fragmented that they couldn't do it if they wanted to. And so what we see instead is a number of non-state actors including what remains of the Iraqi army, uh, preparing to uh, go into Mosul city and Nineveh governorate, more broadly speaking, um, without any real form of coordination, except perhaps between the strongest forces of the army, which is the counter-terrorism forces, and the Kurdish Peshmerga of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, one of the parties. But will they go in without having come to an agreement on what will happen after this battle? But that's what it looks like, yes. I haven't seen any sign yet that uh, there is a plan, let alone a plan that is agreed by all the various parties that are going to go in um, to, to deal with the day after. There are, of course, ambitions, um, and we've heard some in the interview. Uh, the Sunni al Hash al Watani is one of the groups that uh, intends to go in and, as a stabilizing force uh, and, and maybe run Mosul City. Um, but there are contenders, uh, they are not the only one. Um, and there's an additional problem is that uh, that group may not be accepted by the local population. Jos Tilterman, thank you very much for having spoken to us. Uh, now, for more on this, I'm joined in the studio by France Van Kert's Mark Perelman and our guest, Fala Mustafa Bakir, who's the head of diplomacy for the Iraqi Kurds. Hello, thank you very much for being with us, sir. Uh, we asked that question just there. Uh, when can we expect the battle for Mosul to begin? Well, thank you for having me. Preparations are underway in order to prepare ourselves for the last chapter in the fight against ISIS. It will be a matter of days in order to have this important fight to liberate Mosul, but it's important for coordination to be there among the forces that will be taking part in this and also for consideration to be given for political arrangements for the day after, because this would be a tough fight. It will not be an easy fight, but it's doable. The military part is much easier than the political part for us. For us, we believe that we have to address the root causes that led to the emergence of ISIS in Iraq. If we cannot address the causes of the problem, we may end up having another cycle of violence. Therefore, Baghdad has to ensure that the Sunni community feel that they are part and parcel of this process, that they have a future, and for those who have suffered under ISIS, they can expect a better life post-ISIS. For us, we believe that militarily we have to coordinate, politically there has to be co cooperation, and also humanitarian-wise, we have to be ready, because the moment these operations start, we are expecting an influx of displaced people to come, and mostly to Kurdistan region. Uh, I want to go back to the timetable. You said within days Mosul will be assaulted by uh, this uh, coalition. It means that in the current of October we'll see the attack happen. Well, this is the expectation. There have been a number of uh, tripartite and joint meetings between Peshmerga forces, Iraqi army and the coalition. And there has been an agreement on the military plan in order to do it. We have to be mindful of the fact that this would be important because uh, in Mosul, the caliphate was declared. So the, the liberating Mosul from ISIS would be the heaviest blow to ISIS in Iraq, and that would be the beginning of their end, militarily or physical existence. But we have to be mindful also of the fact that we have to address other issues to fight the ideology, to ensure that there would be no opportunity for ISIS or the likes of ISIS to emerge again. There's also another concern that was raised, especially by uh, Turkey in recent days, the participation of the uh, Shia uh, militias. They're obviously a very powerful military force. In Iraq, there have been uh, instances where uh, there have been problems with their role. Do you think, as Turkey has said, that they should not participate in the Battle of Mosul because this could uh, really ratchet up sectarian tensions in Iraq? I believe Baghdad has to ensure that the right forces will participate in the liberation of Mosul. As far as we are concerned, we have made it clear that the Peshmerga forces are ready to participate in this battle. Uh, we have no ambitions or no aspirations to go beyond 
our areas. We will not enter Mosul. We have made it clear that we have allowed access to Iraqi troops to uh, assemble and uh, have prepared staging areas in order to be part of this operation. But it's important for the concerns of the people of Mosul to be taken into consideration. We have seen what happened in Tikrit. We have seen what happened in Fallujah. We do not want to see a repetition of something that would lead to further problems. That's why we, we believe the participation of the Iraqi army is important. The counterterrorism CTS would be important together with the, but not, of the coalition. But not the Shia militia. Unless there is an agreement between the Sunni and the Sunni community and Baghdad on their participation. But otherwise, it would lead to problems. A very quick the humanitarian concern, how many refugees or displaced people are you expecting once the assault, within days, as you just said, starts? We're expecting more than half a million uh, displaced people to come to its Kurdistan region, and that would be a huge responsibility because we already have 1.8 million displaced people and refugees from Syria in Kurdistan region, and the cost on us has been 1.4 billion a year. So therefore, we need international community. We need the United Nations to help us to deal with, because we do not have time. Although some pledges were made, some promises were made, we need to be ready the time these operations will start. Okay, thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you very much for having spoken to us, Fala Mustafa Bakir. No problem, thank you.